Bonjour. Je m'appelle Ilia Birman. Malheureusement, je ne parle pas français. And even if I did, it's an English speaking event, so I'll be speaking English. I'm not good at uh, standing in one point, so I took the microphone. Yeah, I come from Chelyabinsk, Russia. It's a city of about a million citizens, about uh, 2,000 kilometers to the east from Moscow. But I actually came from Tel Aviv yesterday. So I'm an information designer, and I do things like user interfaces, uh, wayfinding, um, information displays, and uh, transit maps are obviously one of the topics of my deep and sincere interest. I'm fascinated by them, and I've designed several of these maps and directed the design process of several of uh, transit maps, which include a number of maps for Moscow, uh, like this one. And there are several of them, including this one for the Apple Watch, which turns out to be quite useful. It doesn't have station names, but if you know the network, it helps you remember like how many stops you need to go before you change the lines by just glancing at your wrist, which is nice. This one is from Minsk, Belarus. Um, when, you, when the network is simpler, you can take more liberties in the design. This is a fragment of a map for Yekaterinburg, Russia. There is just one line. And this is a fragment of a tram network map for Chelyabinsk, my home city. And it's actually the official map. It's been official for about a year now, which makes me very happy. It's in every tram. And those of you who uh, had this point in your lives where something that you designed started to appear everywhere. You know how, how exciting this is. Um, so yeah, this is just a fragment. And uh, these projects I've made with some other designers, I will mention their names. So my talk will be in two parts. In the first part, I will talk about the topic that I've announced, which is uh, transit map as a symbol. And uh, then I will talk about the book of mine. And I'll start with the topic. So most of the time when we speak about, uh, when we talk about maps, we talk about their utility, how, how they're used. And we designing them, we ask ourselves questions like, is it functional? How practical is it? Uh, we want it to be consistent. We want it to be legible. And we want it to be maintainable. Like when network changes, we want it to be uh, not too expensive to change. We want to make sure it's accessible to all kinds of people. And I categorize all these uh, as matters of logic. It's something that we uh, know how to... Oh, I can take the clicker. Something that we know how to make well. We, we know a lot of best practices. We know which designations work best for the stations. We know which fonts work better. We know like how to adapt colors to be better distinguishable by the colorblind and, and a lot of stuff like this. And even if we don't know some of this stuff, we know ways to test for it. We, we can uh, ask some customers to uh, you know, plan a route from point A to point B and see how often they, they make mistakes and see uh, how long it takes for them to, to plan this route. So this is something uh, we can research like in some formal ways. What I want to talk about today about the different things, which is aesthetics. And uh, I want us to also ask questions when we look at the map. Is it beautiful? Is it authentic? Like, uh, does it have to do with the city that it represents? Why the map of this city looks like this? Is it inviting? Is it designed in such a way that the customers want to research it, wants to figure it out? Or is it like, it doesn't care? Is it humane? Do we feel that it was made by some human who cares about us? And finally, why not? Is it fun? Does it provoke a smile sometimes? This is a map that we have in Chelyabinsk uh, in some places. It shows, uh, I don't know what, like a lot of uh, transit stuff. You don't want to be the only person on a bus stop when you're waiting for a bus and you have no one to aid you, like figuring out how, how, to, how to get somewhere. This is Amsterdam. Not much better, actually. This map is quite faceless. 
it's hard to distinguish between the metro lines and the trams. The illustrations are out of place, and the channels and the lines are sort of similar. And there's some black dirt on the stops, and some stops look like God knows what. So this is really um, strange. And this is Dubrovnik in Croatia. Look at all these uh, crunches and black circles with arrows. It's easier to take a taxi when you, when you have this one. And so when you see these maps, you may say the problem with them is not that they are ugly, but it's that they are hard to use, hard to understand. And if we fix that, the beauty doesn't matter. Like the utility and beauty are two different things. But that's not what I think. Uh, in my experience, they are very closely related and it's really hard to, to draw a line between them. You may say that it's unfair, but uh, clothes speak volumes. When we see a map and we see that it's beautiful, we tend to rely on it. We, we, we tend to trust it. We tend to think that the system that it represents is well thought through. And when we see an ugly map, we sort of think that maybe this just doesn't work. I don't know, maybe the bus wouldn't come. You wouldn't trust it. So it actually makes sense to make our maps beautiful, even from the functional point of view. Now, when you're a transit agency, of course, you, you want uh, the transit to become more popular, more uh, universally understood, and you try to make it work well. You try to, to make buses arrive on time and uh, not uh, stand in, uh, in, in rush hours. But you also want to make it attractive, so that's uh, a reason to make these maps beautiful. And also, good information designers know that it's not just their job to show the information as it is, but also to make it so that it excites the curiosity of the reader, that it, it provokes the interest from their part, that they, they, it makes them want to figure out what's wrong with these tigers, or maybe what's right with these tigers. Sorry, it's in Russian, so if you don't speak Russian, you won't know. Uh, but actually, they are dying, so it's not a very happy situation. And also, the transit map is a notable piece of graphic design in a city. It's like everywhere. If it's successful, if it starts to be used, you see it uh, printed thousands of times, or maybe tens of thousands of times. So I think we should take some responsibility. We should not make the city uglier by adding our maps to the environment, but we should aim at making the city more beautiful. Finally, I don't personally believe that beauty is secondary. I think there is enormous power and... Uh, profound importance in uh, making beautiful things. It's not something that people leave when they have all other needs covered, as is, it's very popular to think. Sometimes people want beautiful things around them even when they have other problems. That's important, so that's another reason why I think we should think about this. And so I want to go through some examples that I find important. This is a Moscow metro map from 1970s. And I believe it was the first one when they've uh, depicted the circle line as a perfect circle. And from that time, it became one of the most characteristic uh, aspects of the Moscow maps. It helps you identify that what you're looking at is a Moscow metro map. This one is from the 80s. It's a very different style. But still, the circle is here, and you know it's Moscow. This is my design from about four years ago. And again, the circle is here. You cannot remove the circle. It's essential. And recently, Moscow started using uh, this circle pattern in other uh, wayfinding uh, maps, like this one for buses from several years ago. And this one is the uh, modern bus map, and actually all these circles are different circles. They don't match on the geographical map. It's just that using circles became an essential part of uh, what makes Moscow maps recognizable. I think the circle line inspired the designers to come up with these beautiful uh, products for new wayfinding system, which are also of a circular shape. If you look on the map, you will notice that Moscow actually has 
this uh, circular pattern in its structure. So it has several ring roads and several radial roads. So it sort of makes sense to depict Moscow in this way. But if you look closely, you'll notice that the circle line of the metro doesn't match any of those circles in the city. So uh, on the right, uh, most of the stations are on the garden ring. But on the left, most of them are about one station farther from the city center. So I think it took some designers' courage to actually uh, decide to depict it as a circle, even though it may disorient uh, some people. And now everyone thinks of it as the circle. And it, when you uh, want to rent an apartment in Moscow, it's very important, is it within the circle or outside of the circle? And everyone means the metro circle, not some of the ring roads. Moscow has launched a new ring railway road uh, a couple of years ago which is represented with this red outline. And this railway, the, the, the actual geography of this railway is far, far, far from a circle. But the designers decided to still depict it as a circle because they think this is essential for the image of Moscow. This is London, of course. There is also a circle line and it's never been officially depicted as a circle as I know. It's more of something in between a bottle and a spiral now. And nobody thinks of it as a circle, like an image of a circle, even though it's called a circle line. But if you try to do something like this in Moscow, you immediately lose this connection with Moscow. This is one of the maps uh, that were designed uh, several years ago. It was not official. And uh, when you see this, what is this, octagon, I guess? Uh, it's not Moscow. I mean, in, in the minds of people, it's not Moscow. There are some smaller details that make the Moscow map the Moscow map, like the transfers are represented with gradients that are very different from, for example, the London's black corridors. If you look at the London map, you'll see that the singular stations are represented with these ticks that stick out two-thirds of the line width. It's important. In Moscow, they stick full line width and they look much more brutal. And if you just change this in the Moscow map, it looks very different. It no longer looks the way you used to see it. And this graphics is used all over the system now. This is a car line diagram of line 7. And if you look closely, you'll see that there are gradients and there is a circle line as a very important part that helps you orient in the city. In this map, they use the line numbers in the circles, which are not used on the big map. So it's a little bit different, but the gradients uh, help you connect it with the map that you're used to seeing. And this one is a tram map for London. And when you see it, you may ask a question like, why would you even need to use this schematic map for a system which has one and a half routes? And this is a valid question, but what is interesting about this map is that when you see it, you immediately recognize it as a London map, just because it uses the graphical standards that London is using everywhere. The font, the design of the this, uh, singular stations, the intersections, all this stuff. So even if it's not important to just ride the trams, it's important for the TFL brand to, to, to make people understand that this has to do with London. So the graphics that was used on the London map spread, uh, like the tube map, spread outside of that map and got to be used on this tram map. And it's actually spreading outside of all the maps it's used in the communication of, uh, of TFL. And you may notice that these sticks on the macaroni tube stick out two thirds of the way because these represent London lines, not some random lines. And uh, also they spread outside of London to the whole world. So yeah, you, you saw a lot of uh, designs of everything that used this London graphics. So it's very popular and very well recognizable. And this is a frame from some video that I found on YouTube that where people were trying to make the tube map with uh, candies. Like, why would you do that? But 
there is something powerful about London Map that makes people want to do these things. And I think that's something we should aim to be doing. We, we, we should aim to be designing maps in such a way that people love them. So when you just copy the London graphics or some other graphics that you like, you just promote London with your map. There is some use and some utility in unification of uh, graphic elements that you use in your designs. But when you do this unification, you lose the branding aspect and you lose the recognizability aspect and you just promote London or Paris or, I don't know, New York instead of promoting the transit system of the city you're designing for. This is a New York map designed by Cameron Booth in the style of London map. You may see that the stations are designated in the way they are in London. And if you don't know these maps well enough, you may think it's a part of London map just because it looks so Londonish, I would say. But there are two things that make it not London. First is these short station names with the street numbers. They are nowhere to be seen in London. And also the designations NQ, which represent the services in New York, which are not used in London. And these circles are actually very important for the recognizability of New York uh, subway system. So they've been used on the map for several decades. This is a map from 1979 by Michael Hertz. And even if you look at these uh, discs just uh, without any context, without any maps, they still remind you of New York if you've been there. They look so New Yorkish. And uh, does any one of you remember what the logo of uh, New York subway looked like? Well, maybe some of you do, but no one cares. These circles are the logo. Uh, no logo is used on the entrances. They just put these uh, service discs and, and that's it. And that's how you recognize that there is a subway station here. And I have several pictures. And the same is used on the pedestrian wayfinding, where they uh, use this list of discs to show where the station is. Like if you see this Canal Street, it doesn't say subway, it doesn't put a logo. You just know. There is another detail that I love about these New York pedestrian maps. If you take Helvetica, you may notice that it uses uh, a rectangle to, uh, as a dot above I's and J's, and they've changed it. Now they're using a disk, and so they have a special cut of Helvetica just for wayfinding in New York, just because they wanted more of these disks. And maybe one out of a million knows this, but who cares? If you know this, you feel like there is some, uh, some humanity in it. And this is a picture I just made in Tel Aviv a couple of weeks ago. I don't know. I just thought of New York when I saw this. I have no idea what it is. This is, of course, Yuktorovich's map for Luxembourg. And Yuk has uh, told us about why he used this 18 degree angle grid. And it made a lot of sense if you know what the city looks like on the map and how it's structured. And as I understand, it helped you better plot the lines, make less turns and so on, to make, make it easier to understand. But this is utility. What's important uh, from the point of view of my topic here is that this 18 degrees angle grid makes this map very, very special. If you saw it once, you immediately recognize it as a Luxembourg map, not just some other map. And also this 18 degrees thing already started to spread out the, the map itself. Like, you see this uh, title there? I don't know, did you put it like this or did somebody else do it? Great, so that's, that's important. So you start to do something that goes outside of the map and starts to be used somewhere else. So maybe, you know, this angle becomes uh, really essential for uh, you know, for all the communication and all the branding for Luxembourg transport, I don't know. That would be great. Maybe it's already happening. I'm not sure. Great. Congratulations. That's... Oh, okay. Another example. This is a bus network in the city of uh, Simferopol in Crimea. And there are three squares in the center of the city, 
through which most of the buses pass, and they're represented with these circles. And here is the logo of the transit uh, company. And so why not, right? It's great when you can find this, and they, these, are, these are the buses. It's great when you can find some connection between the map and the bus and the logo and the design of the stops and whatever there is. I don't know if it's real, because I saw these pictures on the website of the designer, which is Art Labative Studio. Uh, I've never been to Crimea, but uh, it's not important for my point. This is Paris map. I don't know any specific things uh, that I could say about the, the, the graphical details of this map, but one thing that immediately gets noticed when you see this map is the color scheme. It's uh, very special, uh, and uh, in this redesign by Konstantin Konovalov, everything has changed, but he has maintained this color scheme, and so it makes this map immediately recognizable as a Paris map. I, I think that this uh, color scheme is very characteristic of this map, but unfortunately it's not universally used here. Here, here are a couple of photos that I made yesterday. This one in the train that I took from the airport. For some reason this map is on the gray color, and this is on white, and also the style of all the graphics is different, so I think it needs some time to, to unify. Uh, I don't know what's the, the thinking behind this, but this is something that I think we should think about like a, a system when we design a map, like how it will be used when we show just the fragment here. And so I think the map and the city should enrich each other. When we design a map, we should look at the city, we should make sure we understand the city, what's going on in it, and research what's the signage uh, like, uh, what the benches look like, what, what are the landmarks, uh, what is the street layout, how, how does it look on a map. Maybe some other aspects of the city, the nightlife, the food, uh, I don't know, what's going on with the nature. In uh, Tel Aviv, there are a lot of palm trees. I was surprised to see some in Paris yesterday. There is not a single one in Moscow, I think. And it makes cities different. I don't know how to use this information on the map, but it's something to just, uh, to just think about. And this is a picture from the Moscow Wayfinding Office b before they started to implement the new wayfinding system. They researched whatever there was already in the city and they collected the huge collection of photos like manhole covers and architecture examples and colors that are used and whatnot, and fonts and signage and, and whatever. So they just collected all these examples to make sure they take everything they, they can take from the city to be used in these designs. This is for pedestrian wayfinding, not for some transit mapping, but it doesn't matter. That's the approach that I think it's important to take. So this is how you make the, the city inform the design of the map and, and enrich the design of the map. But I also think we should do it in the opposite direction. We should do something with the design of our maps that the city could take and then use uh, everywhere, uh, like, um, I don't know, like these circles that are used on the New York maps. And also there is a quote by Johnny Ive, who is a chief design officer at Apple, of course, that I found, I don't know, maybe a month ago somewhere. He said, using the Mac, I sensed a clear and direct connection with the people who actually created it. For the first time, I remember being moved by obvious humanity and care beyond just the functional imperative. So this is another reason why we should think about this stuff. And I want to show you some of the things I uh, like to, to, to care about in my projects. Uh, this is a Moscow map, and you may notice that the transfers are represented by not just circles with corridors between them, but more like uh, this peanut-shaped things with organic uh, curves and whatever it may be called. And uh, they tend to change when there are connections with like three or two or four stations, and they're different, like uh, in the middle you see when there is just a straight path between the stations. You cannot directly go from the red one to the blue one. You need to 
passed through the platform of the green one, and the one that is uh, in the upper left corner is where you can go from anyone to anyone. And uh, also there are shadows, these uh, transfer designations cast shadows, but only on the lines, not on the background of the map, just because it looks cleaner. And it doesn't have to be like this, it's just to make it nicer. This is the Katernberg map uh, designed by Pasha Milochen and directed by myself. There are a lot of small details because there is just one line, we can uh, play with it, we can make it more interesting, we can add uh, some landmarks, we can add some parks, we can even draw a bridge like this. And it will not confuse anyone, it will not add cognitive load, you know, when, when you have a complex network you need to remove all the extra details that just uh, are, are not necessary, but here, why not? And also we put the designations of all the exits, how they are positioned in the city, so you may uh, understand like where exactly you will uh, get out of this uh, metro. So yeah, simpler networks allow for more experiments, and so when I see young designers start to draw a map of their network in the city when they have, I don't know, uh, one or two metro lines, and they will just make them in the style of London map, this is really boring. Uh, and it makes sense for the trams map of London for the reasons I've uh, mentioned uh, before, but if you're doing something new, do something new. This is Minsk again, and here there are two lines and they intersect in the middle of the city. You don't need to put this, you know, black uh, outlined circle in the middle to show this connection because it's the only one, you cannot miss it, you can just make it uh, with this uh, gradient line, you can put the designations of the exits. And also you can add some three-dimensional buildings to help people orient around the city. And also you can put either or either, I'm not sure what, what her name, uh, how her name is pronounced, in one of those buildings. I don't know how many of you know who she is. She has nothing to do with Minsk. Uh, it was just, uh, just for fun. She's a character in the game called Monument Valley. If you don't know it, I recommend you to play it. It's, I think, the best game, like, the most pleasure you can take playing a game. There is no way to lose this game, so this speaks a lot. And so, because this game was uh, drawn in, in this uh, three-dimensional style, when we were drawing our buildings, we just decided, why not? Yeah, and it was designed by Ivan Zwegen and Konstantin Stratenko and uh, directed by myself. And also, oh, what's going on? And also in our Chelyabinsk map, I think we have the most beautiful designations for the terminals uh, on the planet. I just, just love them. Maybe you call me crazy, but I just wanted them to be like this. And also if you, you see there's a bus that goes to the airport, if you follow its route, you will see that there's an airplane that takes off. It doesn't have to, but why not, again. so. This is one of those things that I think it's important to do. And this is designed by Polina Lesnikova and uh, Alexander Karavayev and also directed by myself. And this is the official map of Moscow Metro and uh, it has a lot of details that you can also speak about but there is one of that kind that is just there to provoke a smile and I'm so happy that it survived and it's there in every carriage of every train, and I'm talking about this bow on the river. The designers just put it there for fun, and first the transit agency was trying to get rid of it because like, it doesn't make sense, but somehow they found the right words <laughs> to, to make it stay, and it's there. And these maps are from Kaliningrad, Russia, from Soviet era. Uh, they are no longer used, uh, unfortunately. I have no idea like why and uh, do they even have these transit systems today? I've never been there, but it's just so, so beautiful. You want, you, when you see this, you want to make your maps look like this. Okay, so I don't know how much time I took, but now I'll talk about the book. So the book is called Designing Transit Maps. And uh, 
the things that I was talking about today is actually a chapter in the first part of the book. There are five parts in the book, and the first one is called the challenge, where I talk about the discipline of transit map design. I talk about the history of this area and what makes it uh, complicated, what makes it challenging, and how do you approach this. In the second part, I talk about the most fundamental principles that are used in the map design, like geometry and uh, level of detail and color coding. In the third, I talk about the fact that the map is not just the map, it should work on a poster that you put somewhere, and so there are a lot of other things that go in, in, in this poster, like the transit agency's logos, or the city's coat of arms, or a list of services, or an index to symbols, or, I don't know, something else, maybe some schedule. So you need to also think about the layout of all this, and this may change how you plot your lines. So I think it's important also to talk about this. Uh, the fourth one is my favorite one. It's about the tiniest details. Uh, I talk a lot about how you, like millions of ways you can uh, represent a transfer or a uh, a pond or a park or whatever there is, or how you align a label to the station and all this uh, sort of stuff. And finally, the fifth part is about that the map that you make is actually not just this graphical image, but a graphical language that is used throughout the system for other kinds of maps, not just line diagrams, but maybe different um, different views of the map, like uh, step-free access maps, bike access maps, night maps, and whatever, and how to, to be ready for all these sorts of uh, changes. Also, the networks themselves change. Their stops get renamed and added and removed, and your design should survive this. So that's another thing I talk about here. Here are just uh, some spreads of the book. This is a crazy map from Tokyo. And these you have already seen. Uh, something about color coding, orientation, bundles of lines. This is one about how you align the, the label to the tick. This is something about line diagrams. And this is search. You can just enter anything you want and find where I talk about this. So this is a digital book which is released by Bureau Gorbanov Publishing, and I want to give you a small demo. So this is what it looks like. Where is my cursor? Oh, here. So when you start to scroll, you, you, you may notice this nice animation here. And uh, yeah, so this is a demo, which all of you can see. I will give you the address later. It shows just one of the chapters, just for you to give, to, to, to make a sense of what it is. And it's about the chapter which is called bends. There's a whole chapter on how you bend the line, believe it or not. So, yeah, you should make the bends uh, smooth, and uh, but you make m must make sure that you don't bend the line under a transfer because this gets uh, lost. Like the the reader will not see it, and maybe will think that this line continues here. So you need to make sure that the bends are outside of the transfers. Sometimes it's better to make two 45 degree bands instead of one 90 degree one. And if you make this, you must make sure that it actually reads as two 45 degree bands and doesn't look mangled like here. And this is what actually was in Moscow for some time. This place didn't look right. And then they fix it. The bigger the radius, the your map looks. Uh, here are a lot of things about how you bend the lines when there's a whole bundle of them running in parallel. And uh, some illustrator advice as to how to do all this stuff. But this is my favorite part, that when you use the radial rounding, you get the, the curves that look unnatural, because real objects don't bend this way. And so if you learn this once in your life, you will never be able to look at uh, radial rounding the same 
again ever. Many people told me that I've ruined them, their lives by telling this. But if you take something that bends and you bend it, this will not be a section of a circle. And that's why this looks better. So I talk about how to change the Bezier curves to make this uh, turn look better. This is the computer-generated radial uh, rounding, but you want to do this. So as you scroll, you may, may see how these turns become more beautiful. And uh, yeah, there are different problems when you have not 45 degree angle grid. And it's even harder to make all these uh, bundles work well together when they are hand-drawn. But I give some example and show where the problems may arise and how to solve them. And there are many examples and some other examples and some other illustrat illustrator advice, like how to not draw every turn, uh, but just draw it once and make illustrator make them all the same, and I show it by drawing some crazy turn, and it gets copied automatically to all the places. And some other example. So this is just one chapter, and uh, yeah, so this is live and interactive. As you scroll, you see some things change, and when you read one paragraph, there is one image, and when you read another paragraph, the image changes to reflect what I talk about in this paragraph, so this has to be digital. I have no idea how this can translate to paper format. Maybe one day I will figure it out, but for now that's what it is. And I aim for it to be very, very practical so that you can just use it as a reference. If you have some problem designing your map, you don't know how, how to show some difficult place, I want you to be able to go to this book, use search or whatever, to find examples from all over the world where this is covered and uh, maybe borrow something from there. So it's now available only in Russian. It's going to be like my publisher and I are working on this in English, but it's not ready yet. So I want to invite you all to go to transitmapbook.com and uh, what you can do there is uh, read about the book, look at some pictures of the spreads, and also you can see this demo that I was showing. It's really live, you don't need to pay or anything, it's just a click away. And uh, I want to invite you all to leave your email addresses so that we can uh, send you a notification when the book or some other of our books are available in English. And we are also working on a couple of other books, one on user interfaces and one on typography and layout in this format. Uh, so, yeah, like two points <laughs> that I was trying to make here is make beautiful maps and uh, check out my book. And with this, merci beaucoup. Uh, if you have questions. You're a tease. I was ready to buy the book right now, but not in Russian. I need it in English. Oh, yeah, that's the problem. Any questions for Ilya? Uh, thanks for that great presentation. It's, it's quite a, what's the word um, I'm looking for? Uh, it's quite an achievement, I think, to, to show this kind of information in, in this interactive form. So my question is... Thank um, you. <laughs> you're welcome. So my, my question is, when you were showing the bunching of the lines going around curves and the adjustments of the curves, so this reminds me of the work that Transit uh, did. And I don't know if Leo is still here. Leo is. Hello, Leo. Yeah, I'm talking about you. So uh, Transit did some work around this, how to, and you probably know that what I'm talking about, uh, curving around. Now, my question is, is it possible to do that programmatically with data, not, not do it by hand? I think I know what you are talking about. I read some article, like very, very long article about what Transit was doing to make these maps possible to build with algorithms and it's uh, very inspiring. But um, in my experience, one of the things that it, it, it's important to be able to do with these uh, maps, I, have, I even have a chapter here and the chapter is called Exceptions. And this is something that only humans can do as 
far as I understand, sometimes you come up with a principle, with the guidelines, with the standards, with all sorts of limitations that you use to make your map work. And then something doesn't uh, fit in this system. Maybe some one station, you just cannot make it work here. And so you need to make a decision. Either you make the principle different so that everything fits, or maybe everything else fits so neatly that you just need to make one exception. I don't know, maybe just, just ask your font designer to make a slightly narrow font, which nobody will notice but you will make the station name fit and everything else will be intact. And this is something I think we still need a human for. What I, and also things like putting Ida on this building and you know putting a bow on the river, it's also th something that a computer, uh, at least today, cannot do. And so I think that the programmatic approach could be very helpful uh, as a starting point, so that uh, you can just say, okay, I want this uh, this uh, sub, sub uh, part of a system, and I want it with these and these layers, and I want it to use, I don't know, 45 degree angle grid and uh, whatever else, so generate me a, a map. And it generates you a map, and then it lets you open it in Illustrator somewhere, and then tune this or that a little bit. Also, Illustrator would be much more useful if it let you maintain the angle grid automatically. So there's a lot that can be improved with the software, but I don't think this can be completely solved with software, at least uh, from the point of view I'm talking about, to make this map really uh, special and interesting. I have a question. Since, uh, yep. since I can't buy your book yet, I noticed in the very last chapter you have a section on Planning for the future, I think it was. <coughs> Designing for the future, right. So I realize that this is probably, it could probably be a, a whole talk in and of itself, but could you maybe speak a few sentences about how you approach Designing for the Future? Oh. Well, you know, the, the, there were a lot of things said about how it's complicated to make a map and uh, to think about all the, all the things that must be uh, displayed on the map. But when I find something that is hard to do on the map, I think about the fact that there are some people who are drilling tunnels underground. Why are we even saying that there is something hard about our work? It's the simplest work in the world. We just click mice on our computers and that's what we do. It's really simple. So when you think about what your map will look like in a year, in five years, in ten years, when things change in the city, you I always try to think that there is somebody who knows what's going to happen in a year or in five years because it doesn't happen overnight. You cannot just build a new metro line in one month or something. So there is already a lot of information about what is going to happen in the following years. And so I think that when you design a map, you want to take all this information into account, like make sure your map works in 10 years even though it's uh, far away, and then maybe just remove some of the stuff that is not uh, relevant for the passenger. So, well, in this uh, chapter about designing for the future, I don't talk about you know uh, some three D glasses or whatever, uh, some uh, contact lens through which you can read the navigation system in your language or whatever is going to happen. I talk about very, you know, practical, down-to-earth things like how can you think what will happen in the future to make sure you don't need to redesign the whole map. Uh, thanks. It's uh, first of all an observation about the exceptions. Uh, Massimo Vignelli has a, a reputation of being one of the most rigorous minimalist uh, subway map designers. But in an interview I did with him, he said, "Well, of course we don't follow the rules like blind men. We make exceptions." Uh, so I think even in, in Massimo's case, uh, there are exceptions. But my, my question is, uh, is your criterion for good map design purely aesthetic uh, and intuitive, or do you refer to usability studies? I'm thinking of, say, the work of Maxwell Roberts at Essex University, where he creates experimental maps, and then he uh, runs tests uh, of navigation on them. Um, so I'm just wondering whether usability tests form as part of your criterion for what is good design. I wasn't lucky enough to have a lot of maps that 
people actually use. There's only one that became official in Chelyabinsk. And uh, because there was no, like, no sane design before that, it's hard to compare it with anything. And uh, it's much better than nothing. And so that's, that's how it works. And it took a lot of work to just con convince the authorities to make it be there. So I hadn't have a chance to, to test it like in some formal way. But these things, of course, is what you start with. It's, um, that's, that's why I started my talk with this. I uh, fully support the, the, the notion that the map, it's, uh, f its function is to make the passenger get from point A to point B and not to be uh, you know, displayed in, in an art gallery. But I think that these do not contradict. I think we can solve all this, we can do all the testing necessary, we can fix all the problems that we've discovered with testing and still also do something with this. At least that I think we should aim for. I don't know if sometimes we don't have time, but um, I, I don't think this, this, this is a contradiction. So yeah, if, if I have chance to research the way people use some of my maps in real life, I will be very glad to be part of it and figure out what, what I got wrong when, when I was designing this. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was like really inspiring. But when it comes to these criteria of aesthetics, often like very individual choices are made to well fit a certain place or city. Earlier today we talked about the consistency, the recognizability across all metro maps in the world. How do you how do you compare like these custom style compared to like a, an overall strategy that that creates recognizability? Uh, yeah, on all metro maps. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can uh, you maybe your your maps are not standard and quite unique in their identity. Do you think, therefore, they are as legible as if they would be standard, standardized? Yeah, I think there's place for both. If you are a brand that produces clothes, you want your clothes to be special, you want your stores to look special, you want people to think of the clothes that you produce as of something special, you want them to feel part of a club and, and whatever. And uh, you don't want to make everything the way all the other stores do, like put the, you know, put the t-shirts there and the, the the boots there and I don't know the pants there, so that everyone is easily oriented in this space. Maybe you should borrow some of these, but you will not copy it. You will just look at this and maybe do something better and something that fits your uh, brand better. Because branding is important. And I think this is what's important for transit agencies also. They want, at least as far as I understand, they want uh, their networks to be attractive and they want their networks to, to have some, some uh, graphical you know, power behind them. But on the other hand, from the user's point of view, it's not something they care a lot about and sometimes y if you want to buy a t-shirt you don't care like what brand it represents maybe you would use some app where you have a lot of t-shirts from all the brands where you can put your criteria like color and size and material and whatever and it will show you all of them and you would just pick one and it would turn out to be I don't know H&M or whatever and you don't care so I think these can just coexist. You can uh, you can have this application from Yug, which uh, gives you all this map in a similar style, which helps you get used to them and immediately understand them because you know this language when you come to some other place. But when you come to that place, there's a reason for the transit agency there to to do something special. So I think this both both should exist. Anyone else? Yeah, just on the question that Alex Alex asks asked about the opposition between automatization and manual maps. I fully agree with the answer, and the question was targeted to me. So we always tend to think that automatization is going to be better than manual because it's going to scale and because it's going to be more efficient. But in some cases, automatizing something is going to take longer than doing it by hand. 
And the more data you add, the more edge cases you face, and the more improvement of the algorithm you're going to do. You can call that tweaking if you want. And so I think we should not see it like that. And I think that in some cases, like maps, the number of edge cases that you will face will worth having a human behind that. And you were speaking about transit. If you compare transit apps, you will s different transit apps, you will see that it's the only one which has not stopped names on the map. OK, anyone else? I'm not missing someone else? No? All right, thank you very much, Ilya. Thank you for coming. Thanks.